What's growing on, gardeners? It's Saturday, March 2nd, and it looks like we are going to have an early spring here on the southeastern coast of North Carolina. And that means we are going to start transplanting our seedlings out into our gardens. Proper transplanting technique is critical if you want your newly planted seedlings to take off. Otherwise, they may sit there for a while and not do much of anything. And on today's video, I'm going to show you how to properly transplant your seedlings so they take off like a rocket. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe and hit the bell to receive new video notifications and check out our Amazon store and Spreadshop links in the video description for everything I use in my garden and awesome custom designed apparel and other gear. Your support is greatly appreciated. Step number one may be the most important step of all, and it is not something to do, it is something not to do. And that is to not let your transplants outgrow the container that they're growing in. It's a habit of gardeners to want to plant out the largest transplants possible into our garden, thinking the larger the transplant, the bigger jumpstart we will get on the season, the sooner we will have a harvest. And that is generally true up to a point. And that point is when the transplant starts outgrowing its container and it becomes root bound. This transplant right here is a two month old tomato transplant. It is a dwarf tomato project tomato called Dwarf Emerald Giant. And it is at the absolute limit that this container can hold. If I pull the tomato plant from the container, you can see the roots are still white and healthy. They look very nice overall, but they're getting to the point where if I let it go any longer, they will start spiraling around the container. And that would mean that the plant is starting to become choked and root bound. And we do not want that. So it is important that we plant this as soon as possible before it becomes root bound. On the other hand, this tomato transplant right here is a very vigorous determinate variety called Legend. It is an early tomato that I started the same time as my last transplant, but because it is so much more vigorous, it has begun to outgrow its container. So if I pop this container off, look what you see all of the roots are spiraling around. So this tomato is actually past its prime. It has begun to outgrow its container. And because of that, this transplant is more likely to be stressed out when I actually do transplant it. Now, because it has outgrown its container, you're starting to see the plant actively flower. And that flowering is a stress reaction because it's outgrown the container. Usually when fruiting plants become too root bound, they react under stress and they start flowering because they think, they're getting choked off and they have no more room to grow, so they better reproduce before they wind up dying. So that is an unhappy transplant right here. It is very important that you don't allow any of your transplants to flower in the container. That is a bad sign. For one more example, in this tray right here, I have brassica transplants. This is cabbage, and this is exactly what you want to see with a transplant. That transplant right there has healthy white roots. They have not started wrapping around that, that, star, that starting mix right there. So overall, it looks fantastic. That is a good looking transplant right there. Step two is proper planting depth of your transplants. And there's a lot of different opinions on this, but generally speaking, the overwhelming majority of the things that you transplant should be transplanted flush with the final grade of your soil. So however high your soil is going to be at the end, that is how high you want to plant them. And this is a cabbage transplant right here. Basically, we want that cabbage to be transplanted flush with the soil line. So the top of this transplant is going to be flush with the top of our compost layer at the very end. And I will show you more on that later. The exception to this rule are tomato transplants. Tomatoes are one of the few transplants that do well when you bury them a few inches deep. That's because they have the ability to make root nodes up along the stem. So when you bury the stem underground, they can potentially develop a larger root system. However, what I'm going to do with these tomato transplants is I'm going to plant the root balls flush with the top of my soil because at the end, I'm going to come in with two inches of compost everywhere. So because I'm going to be doing that, basically they will all be buried two inches deep by default. So consider that if you're going to add a compost layer on top of your soil, you need to factor that depth into the planting schedule. One thing that I recommend every gardener do is lay out where they're going to plant everything before they start digging the holes just to make sure everything is spaced properly. Now in this first raised garden bed right here, I already prepped this bed in an earlier video. So it has all new fresh mushroom compost and it has all new mulch on top. So for these 
tomatoes in this bed right here, they are going to be planted flush with the soil line. However, this bed I have not rehabbed for the season yet. This has no fresh compost and all of the mulch is old. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plant these things a little higher because I'm going to come in at the end and I'm going to add new compost to it, which again, two inches of compost on top. More on that later. Now, if you're like me and you allowed a few of your transplants to outgrow the planting container, what should you do? Well, this is the legend tomato that I showed you. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to take my hands and I'm going to kind of break up the roots a little bit. Anywhere where they're kind of spiraling, I'm just going to lightly fluff them up. And if you're going to ask me, will that stress them out and set them back a little bit? Well, yes, probably. And what is the cure for that? Don't let them outgrow the container. That's the best advice I can give you. This is unfortunately a reality of the situation because I allow this plant to outgrow its container. Now, because this is a tomato plant, one of the things I will be able to do is bury the stem. And that's because this stem has a really weird bend in it. So if I planted this flush, there's a chance it could break off in the wind. So I'm actually going to lay this root ball down in the planting hole like this, which brings me to my next subject. Step three is fertilizing the planting hole. It's very important that we amend the planting hole with a few organic fertilizers that will take a long time to break down in the soil and over time trickle feed our plants with the necessary nutrients that they need to become big and strong. And the first fertilizer we're going to use is an organic all-purpose fertilizer. I'm going to use this Plant Tone 533 NPK but any organic all-purpose fertilizer around a 555 NPK will work just fine. And the second product we are going to use is a finely ground bone meal product. Now, bone meal is dehydrated, dried bones that have been ground up into a powder. So they contain very large amounts of phosphorus and calcium. And this is fantastic for root development. It takes a few weeks, if not a couple months, to break down in the soil. So it will trickle feed your plants over a long period of time and give you strong root development. It is also great for the flowering and fruiting phase because Phosphorus is predominantly responsible for the flowering and fruiting of the plant. We can amend our planting holes directly with these fertilizers because in their current state, they are not actually fertilizers. They're precursors. They have to be digested by the microbiome, the bacteria and the fungi in the soil. And then when they decompose in the soil, they release their nutrients. So because of that, we can apply these directly. So first we're going to start with the organic granulated all-purpose fertilizer. And we're going to apply a generous handful to the planting hole and make sure that it gets all in the bottoms and coats the sides of the planting hole. Then we're going to take a small handful of the bone meal powder and we're going to dust the root ball with this and the sides of the planting hole. That will give additional phosphorus and calcium for great root development. Then we will simply take the fertilizers and we will do this exact same thing to every single one of our planting holes. If you're curious in any of the fertilizer products that I'm using in this video, I will make sure to place direct links down in the video description for all of them for your convenience. Step four is to add a compost and mulch layer to all of our plants. So first things first, let's begin with compost. Why do we need a compost layer? Well, a lot of gardeners confuse fertilizer with compost. And while there is some crossover between the two, fertilizer and compost are two very different things. Fertilizer is to feed our plants, whereas compost is to feed our soil. The purpose of the compost is to add fresh organic matter to our soil to feed the microbiome, the bacteria and the fungi that is inside the soil to keep it healthy and thriving and processing because healthy soil is the foundation for our plants. Now, when it comes to compost, it doesn't really matter what kind of compost you use. You can use a manure-based compost, a locally made compost, homemade compost. I'm going to use this organic mushroom compost that I get from Lowe's that is from a local regional supplier. What really matters is how you apply it. So what we're going to do is we're going to place a two inch thick ring of compost around the bottoms of all of our plants in the area that the root mass is going to grow. And what this is going to do is add all of that organic matter to the soil that the natural bacteria and the fungi in the soil are just going to love. And 
you know that we have the stinky stuff out right now because Dale is coming to inspect. What does that smell like there, buddy? It shouldn't smell like much. Your compost should be mostly odorless. That's how you know that it is actually fully composted. You don't want stinky compost. Unless you're a hound like Dale, if you're a hound, you can smell anything. Now that our compost layer is down, we must cover the entire area in a two to three inch thick layer of a natural mulch. And this mulch layer is very important for a number of reasons. Number one, it promotes even soil moisture. It will prevent washout of your soil from heavy rain and also retain that moisture in the soil longer by preventing evaporation so you have to water less. It also prevents weeds from germinating because it protects the soil so weed seeds will have a tougher time landing on the soil and germinating. It will also feed your plants over time because as the mulch decays it will release all that organic matter into the soil which will feed the worms and the soil microbiome leading to healthier soil and it also helps suppress disease. Most disease is spread by rainfall or irrigation hitting the soil and splashing the soil all over the undersides of leaves. When you put down a thick mulch layer it prevents a lot of that soil splashing so it delays disease onset in your garden. Now when it comes to using mulch, as long as it is a natural mulch, you will be fine. It's more what not to use when you mulch than what to use. So when it comes to what to use, you can use any natural wood or bark mulch. I'm going to use this cypress blend mulch right here because that's what I happen to have a lot of right now. But you can use cedar mulch, hardwood bark mulch, pine bark nuggets, any kind of natural wood mulch. You can also use things like chopped up leaves, pine needles. You can use old wheat straw or hay, which is what I have in this garlic bed right here. It's old straw bales that I gardened in last year. As long as you know that there's no viable seed in it or there's no chemicals, it is A-OK -okay to use. Just don't use things like dyed mulch. Dyed mulch is mostly old construction supplies that they've ground down and then they artificially dye to make it look like real wood when really you're using plywood and lumber to mulch your garden. You really don't want to use that. You also don't want to use a rubber mulch because you don't want things like old tires breaking down in your garden beds and things like stone mulch don't really add any value because they don't break down and release organic matter into the soil. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to replace any of the existing mulch that we already had in our garden beds and put that on top of the compost layer that we just applied. Then we are going to add new mulch and we want again the mulch to be about two to three inches thick. So that looks good right there. And then we'll add some fresh mulch to this area right here. And here are the final results of the mulching. I've tried to plant my plants in sort of like a diverse polyculture planting where I have tomatoes, I have cabbage intermixed within the tomatoes in empty spots, hoping that as the tomatoes grow, they will shade the cabbage. Then I have some parsley. Parsley has insect repellent properties and also will appreciate the shade from the tomatoes as they grow. Then we have more tomatoes, more cabbage, more tomatoes. We have garlic interplanted within the tomatoes because garlic has natural pest repellent properties. So overall things I think are looking pretty nice. Step five is to water in our transplants with a water soluble fertilizer. Now you may be saying, what gives? I thought we put fertilizer in all of the planting holes. Well, those granulated organic fertilizers take weeks and months to break down. They are not going to feed our plants right now. They will feed them weeks and months from now. So we need to give our plants a water soluble fertilizer that is bioavailable right away so we can feed the plants right away and try and minimize transplant shock. And my favorite water-soluble fertilizer to give young transplants is Alaska Fish Fertilizer. It has an NPK of 511, so it is mostly nitrogen, but it is chock full of micronutrients. All of the nutrients inside of dead fish are what you're feeding your plants. So it's just a cocktail of vitamins and minerals. Now, this is an organic fertilizer. It is water-soluble, and it's immediately bioavailable to the plants through the natural heating and fermentation process. So as as soon as you pour this on your plant's roots, they start to uptake the nutrition. This is my secret weapon for preventing transplant shock. 
And if you really want to boost the plant's growth, you can also add in something like a water-soluble Jax 202020 or this J.R. Peters 202020, which is the same company. It is a water-soluble fertilizer, similar to miracle Grow, but I think it's a superior brand. And it is processed, it works immediately. Now, it is not organic, that is true, but I personally believe that, generally speaking, the benefits of organic gardening is not spraying things in all of those harsh pesticides and fungicides, these water-soluble fertilizers really do boost the growth of your plants. And if you only use them occasionally and do not abuse them, they tend to be very beneficial and they have really no negative impact on your soil. So whether you use a fertilizer like this will depend on if you want to be 100% organic or not. So because these are new transplants, I'm not going to give them the full recommended one tablespoon per gallon concentration of this water-soluble fertilizer here. I'm going to give them a half strength feeding. So these are one and a half gallon watering cans. I'm only going to give them half a scoop. So again, this is going to be a diluted, roughly 50% feeding. Then we're going to shake up our fish fertilizer real nice and good and we are going to pour about two to three tablespoons of the fish fertilizer in each of the watering cans. And then I'm going to fill up these watering cans using the water from my rain barrels, making sure to mix everything well. It is very important that all of these fertilizers are dissolved properly within the watering cans. And now we're going to soak down the root area of each of these individual plants. Now one of these one and a half gallon watering cans should be enough to feed about six of these tomato plants or 10 to 12 of the smaller transplants like the cabbage. So one of these watering cans will probably be enough to do each one of these raised beds. My sixth and final tip are for my gardening friends in cooler climates that when they plant out their transplants, they tend to just stall and sit because the days are still pretty cool and the nights are still pretty cool and you don't get the persistently warm days like we do down here in the south. I'm going to give you two tips to warm up the microclimate of your transplant areas. That way your transplants will grow faster. And the first way is to use something like this weed barrier that I have in the aisles of my garden beds. Now I've done this experiment before where I've taken the weed barrier and I've lined the rows of my raised beds and cut holes out and then I planted the individual transplants in there. And what I found was the black plastic that's exposed to the sun while it's out during the day gave about an additional three to five degrees of added warmth just because the black barrier attracts the warmth of the sun. And while that may not seem like much, over the course of an entire season it adds up to hundreds of additional growing degree days throughout the lifespan of that plant so you can have faster harvests. I just want to caution you that this is more beneficial for warm weather crops like tomatoes or cucumbers or melons. You wouldn't want to do this maybe for something like lettuces or brassicas that tend to bolt in the heat. So make sure that you're applying things that catch additional warmth to plants that actually appreciate it. Another thing you can do is take things like PVC electrical conduits and you can build them as hoops around your individual raised beds or along your individual rows if you use things like earth beds and then get you something like agricultural fabric or even greenhouse plastic to trap additional warmth during the day. I've been slowly converting all of my raised beds over to these PVC structures because I can use them for gardening all year round. I put frost cloth on them during the winter to keep the frost off. I will put insects netting in the middle of spring over them once the insects start popping out and then when it gets really hot during the summer I'll throw shade cloth over them to keep the hot stress of the sun off and this dramatically benefits the plants over the course of the season. I actually like doing this as an open design because it vents better. It traps in a little bit of additional warmth but it still gives good airflow for the most part. And if you're curious about building any of these hoop house structures, I'll place a playlist link down in the video description that shows you how I build all of my individual hoop houses. They're really cheap to build and it only takes about 30 minutes. And that right there is how to transplant young seedlings out into your garden so they immediately take off like a rocket. Now some of you may be saying that this seems like a lot of steps. Do I really need to do all of this? Well, look at your garden like an investment portfolio. What you put in is what you're going to get as a return. Here in North Carolina, we have a tremendous amount of disease pressure and insect pressure that works its way in at the end of spring, beginning of summer. So I need my plants performing like 
finely tuned Olympic athletes, not like couch potatoes. I need them to hit the ground running and get nice and strong so they can start producing while the conditions are still good and so they can resist the diseases and insects that come off in the middle of the year. And when you put in these extra steps, you will be rewarded with finely tuned athletic machines instead of lazy couch potato plants. But you're talking to a guy that's growing a mature avocado tree, lemon tree, and an orange tree in ground in North Carolina. I'm not afraid to put in the extra work because I know what the extra work can give you. If you're willing to make these investments into your garden, they will return on you. And every single year, it will get easier and easier. So I promise you, you will be rewarded for your extra efforts. So everybody, I sure hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and please ring that notification bell so you're notified when I release more videos like these. If you're curious about any of the products that I featured in this video, or any of the products that I use in real life in my garden in general, I have them all linked down below in the video description. So expand that video description. I place direct links for the fertilizer products, and in my Amazon storefront link, you'll see everything I use in my garden in real life. And while you're there please check out my spread shop for custom merch if you want to support the channel thank you all so much for watching and i hope to see all of you again on the next video hey dale what are you doing over there are you on the hunt like usual i like your new shirt what does that say there i love daddy oh do you oh what fantastic what a fantastic fashion sense did mommy get you that shirt buddy did mommy get you that amazing shirt? Because you just look so handsome in it. What are you looking at? Is there somebody out there? Is there somebody out there? You gotta keep that nose going, don't you? You need to know who's in the front yard and the backyard at all times, huh, buddy? Look at that nose go.